Heidi, welcome to the show. And as I was oh. saying, just before I press record, there's been so much that's yes. been going on in the world, um, you know, in, in every basic field out there, basically, and uh, and in your own life as well. And um, I'm just really excited to hang out with you again. And, you know, the, the first thing that I wanted to, because a lot of a lot of people um, know you now in, in the Mind Make Sphere and um, in Siobhan's show as well, because you featured um, very frequently on ours because we both <laughs> love your bits. And um, one thing that I really wanted to ask you to kick things off, because we haven't really had a chance to catch up but, but in between podcasts anyway, is yeah. how, how has the transition been for you moving from like a straight kind of clinical setting, one-on-one, to now doing, you know, the online social media stuff, building out courses? What's that all been like? Mm, yeah, good. Um, it's so much more fun, I feel like, and freeing. I don't need to be dealing with... Um, as many rules and regulations and there's just, it's a bit, you know, looser, I guess, of what that sounds crazy, but like, not like I'm swinging from chandeliers for anything in the courses, but like, yeah. it's just, it's looser, I guess, because you're not so restricted to, you know, protocols or professional bodies that you're a part of and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, doing courses is super fun. And I love being able to just, you know, communicate the stuff that I'm most passionate about, the things I find myself saying a thousand times a day in the clinic. Um, I feel like I'm more efficient. I don't know. Do you feel like that with your course and stuff that you're more efficient because you just get to like all the good stuff rather than not like in a, a session we're wasting time, but there's more chatting about stuff and la la la. Whereas in the course, it's just like, pow, like you're just smashing people with all of this goodness, you know, is that what yours is like too? Yeah. Well, I mean, I haven't, um, we, where, where I'm at with the course is, you know, we, we put it up on YouTube um, as just like a place to sit for the moment. But, but I, I found that what I was really interested in, in when I was doing counseling was um, these particular things that would always seem to come up, you know? So it's exactly like mm-hmm. you're saying, if we could just put all the fundamentals in the course, that way I can mm-hmm. really go deeper with you individually, if that's what you're paying for, if that's what our relationship is. But as long as the fundamentals are out there, because, you know, if it's like finding a direction in life, dealing with trauma, there are so many things that apply to so many people um, Mm -hmm. that if everyone knew that, you know, and I feel like I'm speaking to the choir, preaching to the choir here, but then we can actually go deep from a more personal perspective. So I I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like it too, because I feel like I'm able to make sure with the courses and in online, like in webinars and stuff that I know I've communicated kind of all of the important bits. And I've said all the things where sometimes someone might leave a session and I'm like, Oh my God, we didn't even talk about the shame chart. You know, we didn't even do the shame stick figures. Damn it. Like I forgot something so basic, but cause you're in the flow of the conversation. So yeah, I like courses in that way that I always know okay, if we're talking about trauma, if we're talking about anxiety or whatever, I know I will cover everything that is like the most important stuff. So, mm, yeah. Mm. Yeah. The, the shame chart was good. You know, most people know now that um, we met on a, on a professional level originally. And that was, that stuff was so interesting to me. You know, I never really thought prior to our conversation that shame was kind of a big part of my life at the time. Um, mm-hmm. But uh what, what, when we started talking about the differences between guilt and shame, I think that really opened my eyes up. So it's probably worth talking about actually now, just some of the differences there. If you could give the mm-hmm. listeners an idea, because uh, there's a specific thing that I remember that you said that um, really, really opened my eyes. The, the difference between the two? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll answer that. Um, the way that I draw it when I draw it as a stick figure of a guy holding a suitcase and a guy having the suitcase on the ground and the one who's holding the suitcase is shame and the guilt is the, the suitcase is on the ground. And the difference is the suitcase is the bad thing I've done or the, the thing that I think is the bad thing I've done or the bad thing that's happened to me. Mm-hmm. And shame says the whole thing is circled and I am bad or I am not okay. Whereas guilt says um, it's separate from me. The suitcase is on the ground. It's just the suitcase is the thing that I'm not proud of or is the bad thing. You know, is there such a thing as good and bad? That's another podcast, but um, the the thing, the suitcase is the, the not okay thing. Whereas shame says I'm bad, I'm unlovable. And the problem with shame is that at the the, the core of it or why it's so detrimental is Um, We call it the master emotion. A lot of people in mental health call it the master emotion because it's so powerful. 
Mm -hmm. And um, the thing that is so brutal about it is it makes us believe we're incapable of change. Mm -hmm. So if shame makes you believe that you're incapable of change, usually the way that shame is used is to coerce, manipulate, push people into change. Parents use it when they're parenting, partners use it in relationships, bosses use it with their staff. And they don't realize that oh, when you shame someone of like, come on, what's wrong with you? Um, why would you do that? That kind of tone is undermining exactly what you're trying not to do. You're trying to get the person to change or to stop to doing something. But when you shame someone, it makes them think they're incapable of change because it makes them think I'm bad, not the behavior or the thing I did was bad. Does that make, is that what the one you were thinking of? It's totally the one I was thinking of. And I, yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't remember the, uh, the linguistics of it. I just remembered the suitcase. <laughs> yeah. I remember, I remember the circling suitcase. I'm like, fuck, that's exactly how I feel. I can't seem to separate this memory from, ah, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done that, but oh, well, we're only human. I'm 21st century now to that was a bad memory. Therefore, like I'm, I suck, you know, I just kind of feel like a weird person for that and all that. So mm-hmm. that was a really, really eye opening moment for me. And, um, it, it, it kind of makes me wonder how then, some people develop shame aside from what you just said, obviously of, you know, other people shaming them um, and how people are able to just leave it in the past um, and, and, uh, and recognize it as something that they perhaps felt guilty about before, but it doesn't, it doesn't Mm. affect them in the present. Mm. Well, that makes me think of, and that kind of touches on um, trauma and like, we both know that you and I love, love a good trauma chat. Um, the oh, problem with, <laughs> sorry, what'd you say? It's all we do. <laughs> it's all we do. Um, so the issue or like why shame and trauma are so like, you know, connected together is because um, oftentimes in our trauma, it makes whatever happens. If it's something I did or something happened to me, there's an element of shame that often comes from it or stems from it where the person thinks, Either I'm bad that, um, I would like say in abuse. So if I was abused, I must be bad and not a good, lovable, good enough person. Because if I was, they wouldn't have done this to me or I'm bad because I didn't fight back or I should have said no in a firmer way, or I should have ran away or I should have, I could have done more. Like that's a common one. I could have done more. I should have done more. Um, the thought of I did my best is like rare that someone would walk out of a traumatic situation going, I did my best. Like rarely do you hear that. Yeah. Um, if, if I do, I'm like, wow, how do you think that? And I'm well, gonna that. That one. <laughs> yeah, well done. That's pretty good. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I forgot what you asked, what your question actually was about. Say it again. What was the question again about how you changed no, trauma? Yeah, there's, there's another way to think about it. Um, one thing you said on your show with Siobhan was that, is that that, that uh, car accident or um, uh, people in a car accident or, or in a bus or something, mm. in a bus crash, and mm. you know, a certain amount of people can develop a traumatic um, um aftermath from it, but some people don't. So I'm just, it's like, it's a similar thing of how some people can feel guilty about saying it some people can carry that with them into the future. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. So that's Peter Levine. So Peter Levine, um, guru in trauma land, any of you who are nerds about trauma, like Tom and I are get into some Peter Levine, um, waking the tiger. He talks about in waking the tiger. He talks about this, um, busload of kids that I think in California way, like in the eighties or something, 20 or so kids, um, kidnapped it. Don't worry for those of you that are freaking out. It, it ends up. Okay. Um, they're kidnapped and like, or their buses hijacked and taken to a warehouse. And then like two kids, I think it was two, doesn't matter. You get the gist of it, run away and escape from the warehouse and go get help. Then they followed all these kids for like decades to see like, Hey, how did this impact you? Did it mess you up in any way? Like what was the consequence of it? And the two kids who ran away and went to go get help were the least traumatized out of all of the kids. And they were trying to figure out like, what is that about? And what Peter Levine explains in that book and so many other trauma books that he's written and all the other greats, um, that's all in body keeps the score will say how, if you are able to activate the fight flight response, and if you are able to basically discharge what your body and your nervous system want to do naturally, then you have a less 
likely chance of being traumatized because Peter Levine's definition, which is now my favorite definition of trauma is any experience where I feel profoundly helpless or lose my ability to cope. So in that situation, the two kids who were able to not be helpless, right, who were able to go get help or fight back, um, felt less traumatized and less helpless and I didn't do enough. And so a lot of times when we're doing EMDR or when we're doing um, regular talk therapy, uh, one of the things that we will do as clinicians is we'll say, like, what did you want to say? in that moment that traumatized you? What did you want to do? Well, I wanted to pick the car up off of the person that was pinned below. I wanted to stop the fire. I wanted to tell them to get off me, you know, or whatever. And so what I'll often do in EMDR is I'll say, let's do it. Let's go for it. Let's punch. You know, if you felt like you wanted to punch, let's jump up and let's do some boxing in the air. You want to run and your feet, you know, and I'll see like sometimes people's feet will start going like this and I'll, I'll notice that. And I'll say, Hey, I'm just noticing your feet. Do you feel like you want to run? And it's the nervous system trying to discharge the energy that was activated in that incident, but Mm -hmm. couldn't get out because I was restrained because I was paralyzed with fear. Um, I was little, I was a child, so I couldn't fight back. Um, and so we'll, we'll sort of do it and get it out. Um, and it kind of tricks the brain, I guess, in a way, like it tricks the brain into thinking, oh yeah, it's 1985, you know, my trauma is occurring and we're, we're handling it the way I want it to. You can really trick the brain. It's so fascinating. It's, 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 it's an incredible thing to speak about and hear about. And it's an even more incredible thing to actually uh, experience, you know, and, um, you know, my session with you, I, I, I often talk about it because, you know, I think before we met, we, we discussed how interested I was in dreams as, as, um, as emotional processing and what they do in REM sleep and how, you know, it's like this, the opposite of a Google search and putting things together and, and you know, like you come out of that, you're like, Oh man, I feel something like worse nightmare. But now, now I think about it the next morning, I feel better. And, and, and mm-hmm. what, what I experienced in that EMDR session, because, you know, it was, for me, it was childhood. It was, uh, I was small, didn't feel like I could defend myself. Um, and then just by you waving your fingers, it was, and I had no cognitive influence over this, growing into mm-hmm. a giant and then mashing the person down and, and stomping and punching. And it was very, very dreamlike. It was, it was very, very dreamlike. It wasn't just, well, I, you know, I would have liked to have said, Hey, you know, go to your room. It was like, a, a grew into this bizarre giant. And, um, I, I remember it like a dream and, you know, that night my dreams were very, very different in a positive way. So it's, it is amazing how you say tricking the brain. And it also speaks to something that I'm currently, um, experiencing now, um, training jujitsu. Now, I think because you and I are trauma nerds and so is Siobhan, you know, the people around (laughs) us, it's very hard to not get out of this echo chamber and and just speak about this all the time. But it's it's so amazing and you can become so much more aware of how your body reacts to stress. And, you know, there there was a moment where um, a couple of weeks ago I was on the ground and someone was trying to pass my guard, so basically pass my legs and and get ready to strangle me, which is obviously what you sign up for. Um, And there was a moment where... Uh, he wasn't able to pass my legs and I wasn't able to either defend or attack myself. So we were stuck and I, and I'd never thought about fear on jujitsu. I've never been claustrophobic ever. And I started to feel a panic attack coming up. And in that wow. moment, thank God, because I'm interested in this kind of stuff. It was, Oh yeah. It's because I can't move. So I can't activate the fight or flight. I can't do anything. I can't fight back. I can't go away. I just have to kind of be here until something happens. Um, so there are these moments that that do occur. You know, thankfully with with that awareness, the next time I went back into it, it was studying the shit out of that position so that it wouldn't happen again. But then also just trying to make light of the situation, recognize that it's just the body's reaction to a potentially threatening situation. It's uh it's such a powerful thing to be, you know, relatively trauma informed and understand so that these things, it, it, it provides such a, a compassionate sense for your own body. It's not like, Oh, I'm so weird. It's like, well, it's actually me functioning really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What did you end up doing? Did you go into full freeze response or did the thought of just, Oh, my body's doing its thing. And then did you focus on your breath or like, how did you not go into a panic attack? 
Yeah, it was it was purely just focusing on the breath, you know, because I could mm. feel the shortening starting to happen. So I was like, okay, let's just go the other way here now. And thankfully, it was in a position where his his arm was over the back of mine in an underhook. So there was enough. Oftentimes, it's it's difficult to breathe in jujitsu because you know their shoulders in your face or whatever it is, mm-hmm. and um, sometimes they try and make you not breathe so that you tap. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But it was it was it, there was there was enough room for me to breathe. So it was like, oh, cool. Okay, now it's a moment for me to just go slower on the way out and and, and it actually really helped you know but there was definitely still some some fear after I, I, was, I was shaken up by from that experience and were, you, were you shaking as well were you having a physical response afterwards or did you just sort of feel like you had 20 coffees kind of thing I think because your nervous system is so jacked when you're doing it already yeah just as a result of wrestling and the objective being to try to stop someone from breathing. Um, don't ask me why I'm into this, Heidi, but I'm into this. <laughs> Could be some sadistic thing. I don't know. <laughs> You're not really selling it, dude. I'm no, not like, mm, I'm really want to get me into some jujitsu. <laughs> so next time you come out to Warrigal, we'll go down to the mats. <laughs> you can try oh, to kill right. me. Cool. Yeah, exactly. Super. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just have a coffee. That's all I need to wake up. <laughs> but yeah. you know what it, what it makes me think of, though, is the whole thing of, of just the power of breath. I mean, obviously, Siobhan gets this with doing all of her breathwork stuff. But I think so often, after I learned the connection of breathing to the amygdala and to the fight-flight response and to panic, what changed my life? Like, I don't that constantly throughout the day, if I am about to lose my temper with my kids, if um, I'm going into a um, scary session, like I have gone into scary sessions with um, like an adolescent client who tried to kill themselves. And then I was going into the first session with the parents who um, were pissed. And obviously it was my fault um, because I, they, thought I wasn't doing my job and they wouldn't take any responsibility, but anyway. No. Um, so going into that session, I remember feeling really nervous that I'm about to get my head ripped off in yeah. this session and just standing outside, um, reception, just doing my belly breathing to just really calm my amygdala down and to just slow it all down. And it works every time before I go on stage, if I'm doing a presentation, just I belly breathe all the time. And I mm-hmm. think maybe that is something to help people that maybe don't know about it. Obviously if they consume your stuff, they would probably know a bit about trauma, but um, just belly breathing, you guys. So belly breathing is basically just on the inhale, you stick your tummy out. Like you're trying to make yourself look pregnant. So on the inhale, it's making out your tummy and then kind of, you can breathe in for four, hold for four while you're getting the hang of it. I just say, just breathe and then exhaling out. But that inhale when you stick your tummy out like that, you're opening up your diaphragm. And the cool thing is there's a nerve from your diaphragm that runs directly to your amygdala and the amygdala is the old mate responsible for fight flight. So when anytime you feel stressed, you just do the belly breathing straight shot to the amygdala. Cause you wouldn't breathe like that nice and slow and expanding your diaphragm like that. If you were being chased by a tiger, right. Or if you're in the middle yeah. of a jujitsu fight. So like for you, that would be something I would imagine you use a lot. Yeah. Is doing really calm folk. Well, I mean, as much as you can while you're trying to be killed, but like <laughs> belly breathing so that your amygdala is sort of tricked into staying calm so that you can focus on your next move. Is that right? This is, this is a really interesting area for me. And it's, um, you know, you and I are both obviously very interested in how we mammals got to the point where we can now talk on technology and wear shoes and laugh about the weather. So how, how do we, how we were so unconscious and we've evolved to this level of, of consciousness, you know, one of the things that trauma um, education does is it teaches you, um, this is what, this is what I've taken from it, that we are a system that has evolved to stay alive so you're not a system that's dysfunctional when, you know, your, your, your boss is having a go at you because evolutionarily that could have meant exclusion and isolation and all these things, you know, that are, you know, they're obvious when you, when you take that step. What I find really interesting, and this kind of speaks to what we're talking about, is that you can reverse the, the evolution. So now that we're aware that that's what the body does when it's scared, well, let's trick it into thinking that it doesn't need to be scared. So we do the opposite of what the breathing would be if we're chased by a tiger, you know, all these wonderful things. And I think one of the reasons why I'm so attracted to martial arts is because 
when I see the, the 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 people that are the really really high up, you know, the the black belts, the girls and the guys. What's another? What's a cool thing about jujitsu is size and strength is. 25%, 30% of it. It is, it is a thing for sure, but it's not the thing. You know, there are when I first started, oh, no. even now, you know, there are girls that are half my size, guys that are half my size, they kill, and I'm not massive, but I'm six foot and I'm 82 kilos. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. and they're just killing me because they're so good with how they use their bodies. And I'm I'm really interested in that, you know, but and oh. from, from the um the mental side of things, they're the calmest people I've ever met. You know, and they all, it all speaks to that better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. And um, I, I'm really attracted to that idea of, of safety because it's a, it's a self-confidence booster. It's if you know that you know how bodies work and how to protect yourself, you know, we wish it wasn't the case that we, we didn't have to, you know, we could, we wish we could all be pacifists and pretend like wars aren't, you know, you know, all these kinds of things, but there is that safety that you feel that, you know, I'm, I really know how to move my body and how to move other people's bodies. Mm-hmm. I can just, I'm, I can be calm. And they're always so calm. You know, you watch these people roll on the mats. They're the calmest people. It looks like they're doing the dishes, you know, so <laughs> just, there's a, there's a beautiful mental, um, liquidity and, 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 and aspect to it that, that I really love. I think that's a good point though, that I've never thought about with, um, jujitsu as much as you were selling it to me a minute ago is that it would be good for someone who is um a trauma survivor in taking the power back reclaiming my body reclaiming a sense of confidence and power over my safety and kind of like that could never happen to me again sort of thing and also learning how to um reroute the messages that come through of I'm not safe or I'm under threat learning able because in a jujitsu match I would imagine your brain is constantly going oh my god oh my god we're gonna die we're gonna die and then you have to play this whole little game in your head of going no dude we signed up for this I picked to be here I paid for this you know like I want to be here so to flip it around to go no no brain it's okay it's okay and that's a really tricky thing for a trauma survivor, because one of the key legacies of trauma is I'm not safe in my own body. Mm. So if I'm not safe in my own body, where the hell am I safe? Mm. So martial arts um, is such a great idea for trauma survivors, I think, because then I can feel safe in my body and empowered in my body. Yes. Like that's, so that's it. Jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu actually, hang on. Yeah. Might actually <laughs> be a thing awesome. here. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Well, you, you, you're totally right. And, you know, you see, I'm very interested in, you know, I do it purely for psychological reasons. Um, I'm very interested in my spiritual and mental growth when I do it. It's really fun. Um, mm-hmm. And I love applying my fitness to it, but it is a psychological growth thing predominantly that, that keeps me heading down. And, you know, just, I've been doing it for about a year and a half now. And the first six months was, as you say, you know, if you can think, if you're not completely lost in the, in the world of, okay, I've just been choked again, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times in five minutes because everyone's so much better than me. But slowly you start to make a transition from fight or flight, fight or flight, fight or flight to, oh, he's put his leg there. That means I've got to put my knee there. Or, oh, they're about to do a head arm choke. I've got to pummel my arm. You know, so very, very slowly you start to see anxiety, nervous system coming down to the ability to think mm-hmm. rationally. And, um, that's, that's a beautiful, um, you know, it really speaks to your point about someone who has survived something where they, they felt helpless and were trapped and were potentially, um, Mm. you know, uh, punched and kicked and were in a fight to actually taking the power back. And so many people are on the mats because of that reason, because they were bullied at school. You know, the head coach was bullied at school and that's why he got into MMA. Mm. Um, so it's just, it's amazing how many things out there people might not realize they're doing to actually overcome something that was difficult. Mm-hmm. 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 And just teaching, I think your brain, how to think in a moment that it's stressed is mm-hmm. really an art. Like that's a skill. I think some people might have a natural maybe ability, but most people I've met in my career and personally 
it's a skill that they've developed and evolved. So like athletes, for example, professional athletes are really great at turning. So the, if the amygdala is responsible for fight flight, the cortex is responsible for the kind of logic, rational consequence, understanding um, big picture, you know, cortex is what we want to kind of soothe the amygdala and be like, no amygdala, it's just a stick. It's not a snake. It's okay. That's the cortex's job, right? So athletes will see, have really great ability in that, that they're high pressure, high stress, everything in them is wanting to fight, 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 but they're able to then get their cortex on to go, nope, strategy, who do I want to throw to? How fast is he running at me? And they're able to still do all that logic and reasoning. Um, Race car drivers, you know, people who operate at very high pressure, intense, very amygdala firing stuff. And then same with martial arts would be the same because yeah, yeah. it's so intense and it's so personal and your body is under so much threat that it's able to remain calm. At ER doctors, I would imagine, you know, if we were to CAT scan them, you'd see the same thing. Oh, oh, yeah. Or MRI, sorry. Um, but yeah, so that like learning how to get your cortex more online when your amygdala is trying to take you offline, that's one of the key things of just like trauma recovery. Like if someone ever says like, oh, you know, what am I going to learn in therapy if I have, you know, if I'm a trauma survivor, you know, what the hell can I get out of it? And I'm like, dude, that's one of the things right there yeah. is teaching you how to get your amygdala to chill and get your cortex to come online more so that you can think a bit more rationally and less uh, emotionally and a less, you know, that kind of thing, always freaking out all the time, you know? Now, do you, do you find that with parents as well? Because a lot of your work is also with, with, with parents and, and, and teaching them about child development. And mm. one of the things I wanted to ask you was, you know, it's all well and good for me to throw my head in the ring, you know, and do jujitsu. It's <laughs> like, well, cause it's just me. I'm all good. But I imagine that it would be quite hard to switch that amygdala off when say, for example, you know, the importance of child development and independence and autonomy. So it's like, yeah, you can mm. go play on that swing, but at the same time you're freaking out because you just want to protect it. And there's that really strong bond there. So I imagine that, you know, which I suppose is a really good segue, um, mm. the ability to think rationally in that smooth way um, as a parent would be a massive uh, opportunity for growth, you know? Oh, girl. Yes. <laughs> there's so much. That's probably like the number one yeah. that I would be saying to parents before they have kids is, y'all need to get your amygdalas in check before you have kids and get your cortexes fully operational. Because if y'all operate with fight flight all the time, and that's how your emotional regulation like rolls in your brain and in your body, when kids come along, you are screwed because kids are just like little amygdala, like pokers, you know, they just have little ice picks and they're just like, I'm going to trigger you. I'm going to trigger you. I'm going to trigger you. You know, like exactly. God, when, when you become a parent, it is just like refraining from fighting and flighting constantly. Like the auditory input overload of children, the mess, the, their emotional dysregulation, like, Oh, oh my kids God. are just like you've done so much work though, dude, like, and Siobhan, like when you guys have kids, you guys will be so much more. Like I always say to people, um, for baby showers, like don't be buying baby clothes and like rattles and shit, like buy people therapy, yes. like, buy <laughs> people books, it's you know, so like true. send them to Tony Robbins or like buy them Oprah shit, like yeah. get them to like work on all of this business so that when they, their kid arrives, the kid has less shit to clean up within their parents, basically of their yeah. childhood and their parents and their parents, you know, but like, okay. So with the amygdala and the cortex, there's two bits that are kind of relevant for parents and kids. So one is if you don't know how to regulate your amygdala as an, as a parent, um, you're really going to hate parenting because mm -hmm. they trigger you constantly and, um, activate you constantly and press your nervous system beyond what you even think it's capable of like sleep deprivation, the neediness, the constant touching. Um, mm. oh my God, I dude, honestly, my oldest is seven, almost seven. And I've learned more about myself. Now I start, I'm I turned 40 last year. I started therapy when I was 21, my, doing my own therapy. Um, so I've been doing therapy for like 20 years. Yeah. No shit. I have learned more about myself and grown more in the last seven years of becoming a parent 
than all the therapy and all the things and all the yeah. books and all of the personal development courses I've done and all the kids are nuts. I call my littlest, my little Yoda, because she is so challenging and has taught me so much more about myself than anything. Cause she's angry and fiery and rigid and just strong willed. And anyway, so yes, yeah. amygdala is constantly triggered with parenting. Um, so you need to learn how to emotionally regulate yourself mm. um, and not get angry. Cause oftentimes when parents come to me and go like, Oh, my kids are ragey nut job. Like they just scream and they throw shit all the time. They tantrum over everything, you know, basically like fix my kid, Heidi. And I'm <laughs> like, put the kid aside. It's you. I want to talk about <laughs> because well, yeah, I mean, kids are blank little canvases. They don't come out broken. We fuck them up basically while they're here. Like they come out pure and blank. Um, no kid is born with like ragey issues. No kids bo- like, no, no. Um, it's stuff that, because usually when I say, and how is the anger managed by the parent or how, are, how are you and your partner responding when they rage? How are you responding when you get impatient, when you get triggered, um, when they push your buttons, what do you do? And most of the time, unless you've done a lot of work on yourself, it's, well, eventually I lose my temper. Eventually I yell. Eventually I grab them. You know, eventually I throw something or storm out of the room or become scary in some way. And they don't realize what that's doing and that that is, you know, back to the amygdala, that triggers the kid's amygdala to put them into a fight flight response. Mm. And what does that come back to is safety. So if you're not being a safe adult, if you're not being safe for the child, then yeah, you're going to see fighty behavior, flighty behavior, freeze response, lots of anxiety, you know? Mm. Um, yeah. So that's, that's one bit of the anxiety or the amygdala cortex thing. And then the other would be, um, parents often look at their kids behavior and are like, why are they so dysregulated and why are they so anxious or mad or Um, cry all the time or it's so um, disproportionate, you know, they get their Lego tower knocked over and they like roll on the floor screaming, or you won't get them the lollipop and they throw themselves on the floor, whatever. And what parents often don't realize is that their brain like literally can't like their brain is not fully developed. So if the cortex does all that nice, smart stuff of like consequence and logic and forward planning and impulse control, and the cortex is all like mature and responsible, Um, And amygdala is all what I want now and emotional and just all my feelings are out and about. Um, Your cortex doesn't fully develop till you're 25. Yeah. So like. I'm only just there. (laughs) Yeah. Welcome. Congratulations. (laughs) Congratulations. Thank you though. Okay. But you would know, like you would know though, still, like if I think about the way I used to drink or party in my twenties, versus now oh my god. like oh my god yeah. the stupid choices oh, the yeah. unsafe choices the not thinking about like even how fast i was driving or whatever because the part of your brain that's responsible to go mm, great idea isn't fully like loud until you're 25. So dude, if you're talking about a two-year-old or a three-year-old, exactly, are you joking? Like, of course they're going to be dysregulated and like a shit show on the floor because they're two, they're, they're two years away from this whole thing starting. Like they're so far from 25, you know? Yes. Yes, exactly. And you know, in many ways they're kind of like, I was interested in what you said before. I, I never heard of the idea of like children, being, you know, pure and, and clean slates, you know, I think clean slates is, 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 is so true because it's like in, in many ways, you know, they're, they're completely, they have no idea what discipline is, socialization is. So they're literally just all over the place, but also what's so ironic is that a lot of trauma healing is in going back to those kinds of moments. Like you look at breath work and you look at EMDR, people are acting like two-year-olds to get it all out. So in many ways, they're kind of a little bit wiser than, than how we are when, when society and conformity gets in the way and all that kind of stuff, you know? Dude, they are way smarter than us. They are way smarter than us. Mm. They, kids are closer to source. Kids are closer to heaven, creation, whatever word you want to call it. Kids are closer to truth. Mm. They know who they are. 
Mm-hmm. They don't give a shit what you want. Yeah. They learn that here. Yeah. They learn about how to be manipulated. They learn that from us. Like, they don't come out that way. Mm-hmm. You see a little three-year-old in his Spider-Man costume at the shops. He doesn't care what anyone else thinks about him. Mm-hmm. He is so pure and true to himself of this is who I am and this is what I want to wear. I don't care what anyone thinks and people look at me and I assume they're looking at me because I'm awesome. Not because, right. All of that, like, why are people looking at me and all that anxiety and all that caring what other people think this that's all later. Like until you're about six, your brain is so like pleasant. And like, you look at the sky and you're like, look at that tree mom. And then you're like, look at the ladybug crawling on the ground. Like you're so in this beautiful hypnotic state. Mm. And then you have the adult who's going, come on, we don't have time to look at ladybugs. Come on, we need to go. We you just put your shoes on. You know, yes, that's a cute branch. Okay, yes, let's go. And that's how we like, oh yeah. my God. We like, we beat the beauty out of them through. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's horrifying. You're right. Yeah. And then the, le- the lesson there is, okay, ladybugs aren't important. Trees aren't important. You know, and so much, it's, uh, yeah, it's a, I've never really kind of thought of it like this, but it, it really is interesting, you know. I mean, my first psychedelic experience ever was, you know, the, the one memory I really, I have a few memories of it, but the, the, the most important memory was looking at this incredible purple flower and thinking, holy shit, that's the most beautiful flower I've ever seen in my whole life. It was a flower. Yeah. I, I, I reckon I'd have walked past it a thousand times. You know, and I just, I'd had some mushrooms. I was like, oh shit, that's amazing. You know, so, and I would have, I would have noticed that when I was younger, you know, but now as an adult, sure. it's just, oh, cool. I see it and I'm aware that I'm good, that I can see it as well. Yes. That's Switching. one of the biggest things I learned from Eckhart Tolle and reading, I can't remember if it was Power of Now or New Earth, but this concept about children and how they are so um, close to, yeah. And close to the present moment that we, through time and age and school and stuff, it, it shifts for them. Mm. But that the real inner child that is, I know who I am. I'm not here to um, make everyone else happy and to please everyone. I'm here for me and to do mm. my thing. And I think I'm an amazing artist until your art teacher says you're not very good at drawing people. And then from then on kids, like, I don't really like art, you know, or mm-hmm. whatever. And that like, when you said a second ago about EMDR and breath work and stuff is always about going back to the inner child, like 1000%. If I were to say like, um, or if you were to say like, Heidi, you have one session with everybody on the planet and you can only have one session. What's the like most important session in your child, hands mm-hmm. down. Like mm-hmm. that is always where I'm aiming the work towards always where we end up, where the biggest transformations happen in our child stuff is like, that's where, cause that's where all the trauma is. Like that's where all the wounds are because it's before our brain had evolved, you know, to past 25 and we could make sense of things. And so there's so much pain and suffering from our childhood and that little person that believes I'm unlovable or I'm not good enough or I'm whatever. And so a large part of what I do in therapy with people is I try to go back to find that little person and to heal them and to Mm. speak to them, you know, compassionately and to say things like, sweetheart, you're doing your best. Of course you couldn't protect your mom from your abusive dad or, um, of course you thought it was love when your soccer coach was, you know, taking you off to the side to have special time together. Of course you thought it was special and it didn't make sense to you. And it was confusing because you were seven, mm. you know, or, um, it's just, there's so much wounding that takes place when we're little and we forget to upgrade the tapes. We forget to like yeah. update the operating system that, you know, I'm not, five anymore or 10 anymore or whatever. I wasn't responsible for all that stuff that I thought I was, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, that's a, that's a really great segue that you mentioned Eckhart Tolle um, or Toll. I I have no fucking idea what it is. I think it's Tolle, but it's It's probably (laughs) Tolle. I think let's, it's a people Let's go with that. Yeah. There's um there's something in I think it was uh the power of now, but he 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 was talking about um something which is very applicable to today's society with what's going on in the world. He was talking about the social ego. Do you remember much of that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was amazing because 
you know, all of this work and, and this, this conversation around trauma, what we're talking, we're trying to get old parts to talk, you know, mm-hmm. to, to the cortex and all. And then you see what's going on in the world is really with last year with Black Lives Matter and things now finally coming up to the surface. There's a really incredible analogy of the way I kind of saw the whole thing was when someone goes and meditates and they take time to just be with themselves, all of a mm-hmm. sudden parts of the brain start to talk to each other because mm-hmm. the day has been processed. Maybe that week has and that month. Okay. So now we're going to go a little bit further back 15 years mm-hmm. ago, something 20 years ago. And then, Oh shit, I haven't thought about this in a long time. Oh shit. This mm-hmm. is really painful. I've got to move through this. Mm-hmm. You take a whole society and you just shove them in their houses and you say, okay, this is what we have to do now. And then all of a sudden bits start talking to each other. Remember not all that slavery shit, man, mm-hmm. we never really kind of got to the bottom of that. Hey, and then bang. Mm-hmm. And there's, and there's all the conflict and you know, I couldn't help. I, I, um, I'm, uh, sometimes I think I'm an, a naive optimist. Um, and other times I think, no, nah, it's just cool to have that kind of mentality. But then everyone's like, fuck, dude, the world's going to shit. And I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> we've got this far. And everyone's like left and right and, you know, everything's talking. But in my view, everyone's talking. Well, hopefully that's the idea, you know, that we're now at least starting to hear other sides of things as well. So mm-hmm. as a radical centrist politically, I think it's a good mm-hmm. thing. And um, I just, yeah, I was just wondering what your kind of thoughts were on the whole thing mm. from a, yeah, from a well, think, psychological perspective. Yeah, yeah. I think watching to being American and watching um, last year unfold, well, Jesus, the last four years unfold have been like highly traumatizing for yeah. so many people. Not just um, legit. <laughs> Yeah, like legit traumatizing. And then like, I've never cried about politics, like ever. Like, I think I cried when Obama got elected, but like, not like ever in my life have I cried over things happening. And Black Lives Matter, I remember being on the phone with a girlfriend of mine who's also American and also a clinician and both of us crying. I was in the grocery store crying over like the footage we had just been watching Mm -hmm. and then Trump's response and like all of that. And we were just so like, I cannot believe this shit is happening and I can't believe how it's being handled and just seeing so much um, pain and suffering and, um, oh dude. And then I was worried about like for my family safety with the riots. Cause they're, my family's in LA, yeah. my brother-in-law's LAPD and he was covering oh, some of the riots. And so I was worried for his safety anyway. Um, so yes, I like watching all of this unfold has been fascinating as an American and also as, you know, someone who's, um, my career has been about trauma mm-hmm. and then, the understanding of, um, how trauma impacts people culturally, generationally. I mean, there's like, there is so much that this year just, I mean, even just with black lives matter and the generational trauma that the black community has experienced, like there's, there's so much. So I agree back to your original question. I agree with you that yes. Um, this last year is no accident. It's not, it's not a surprise that, um, everything has kind of unfolded as it has. I think the pressure cooker of everyone being at home with COVID and having to isolate has contributed immensely because everyone has been sort of forced alone with their thoughts. A lot Mm -hmm. of the usual coping mechanisms that people use, drinking, drugs, um, sex, gambling, shopping, whatever. Although the online shoppers were probably, you know, on point last year, but, um, for, for the majority of us, we're really excellent at distracting ourselves and we're really excellent at avoiding our pain and our crap. And so last year, I think just turned the volume up massively. It turned the volume up on anxiety because there's this, you know, um, invisible, tiger roaming the streets called COVID that you could get, but you could be asymptomatic, but you don't know. And the guy you just walked past could have coughed on you. And like, they're just like everyone's, you know, collective anxiety, you know, and then there's global, the kind of global trauma that we've all been through something together where we all felt profoundly helpless. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Yeah, dude. Like it's been nuts, but I think, but I think you're right that it's amazing. And I think it's awesome. And Mm -hmm. although last year sucked in a lot of ways and for millions of people, I am so grateful because we are having difficult conversations. We are changing shit. Finally, people are understanding um, anxiety or trauma that they've never understood before. People are going deep and reflecting and going, I'm sick of myself and the way that I think or the way that I act. I'm sick of being so negative or I'm sick of lacking so much compassion or whatever. Why do I have this stupid job? I hate my job. I want to change jobs. Like this mm-hmm. last year has just been like, whoop, you know, so enlightening, I think for so many people on what do I actually want to be doing with my life? Um, who am I? What am I like? Oh yeah. The, this last year has been nuts. No. Well, it was just, it was just a it was a chaotic circuit breaker, you know. And, and one thing yes. I was I was always interested in from an existential perspective was, you know, how how come how could I when I was doing counselling, um, how can I help someone so that they have enough awareness so that they won't ever have to go through that that the cliche midlife crisis, you know, mm. because because obviously those crises are sometimes the best things that people can go through. That said they are incredibly chaotic periods of transformation. And my idea there was how can we just incrementally expose them to those chaotic waters so that it's not completely debilitating and and completely chaotic, but rather it's just I'm continually on this more authentic path that's that's a little bit difficult, Mm. but I'm keeping my sanity sort of thing, you know. And um, I just saw last year like that and, um, you know, to to, in in many ways – you know, being an Australian, I, I, I was never really interested in politics um, or, or culture or ideology prior to last year, but it was impossible not to get engaged because, as you say, we're all at home, we're all twiddling our thumbs trying to figure something out, and then some dude shoves a knee into some guy's neck for seven minutes. Now, I know jujitsu. Being choked for more than six seconds is really uncomfortable. It's really uncomfortable. So seven minutes, correct? I think it's. I think it was seven minutes, but it just – just, just like egregious, you know, absolutely mm-hmm. appalling. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. what I found really fascinating, you know, being in kind of like that detached position of watching it all unfold and people saying, oh, the left are all, all saying this, they're going to tear society down. It's like, well, the right are saying all this, they're tearing. I'm like, mm-hmm. well, you guys know what each other is saying. That's pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. It's like, mm-hmm. it's, you know, from that trauma <laughs> psychological perspective, it's like, oh, mm-hmm. that memory really affected me. I just couldn't help but feel like a naive optimist, you know. I just It was just a fascinating year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was, um, it was a really divisive yet unifying, like I feel so contradictory saying that, but it was so divisive, but like, so like, yeah. So unifying all at the same time. Like I think of how many of my friends who have, um, you know, family members who support different presidential candidates and how they, I mean, nobody could really hang out anyway for Thanksgiving dinner and stuff because of COVID, but like still there, the, the concept of like not spending Thanksgiving together because certain family members disagree on stuff. I mean, oh. it was just, So, but it's been like that for four years. I mean, I have friends who have their whole families have completely split over the whole Trump thing. And, you know, anyone who's a Trump supporter. Yeah. And anyone who's a Trump supporter is just like not welcome at my wedding. I've heard so many stories, not welcome at my wedding. Um, can't do family functions together. Like, yeah, it's been massively dividing. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, I, think, I, don't, I don't know how you yeah. support him. I, I, I would feel disingenuous without saying that. I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> but I yeah. mean, look, if, if politicians are supposed to bring people together, fuck, you're doing a pretty good job of doing the opposite. What, like, Seriously, dude. I'm not talking about conservative policies, progressive policies. I'm not talking about Democrat, Republican, whether you like things where they are or whether you see things change. The totally person, agree. The person isn't unifying, and that's not a politician, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I would have felt, I, I, I think it was necessary for me to say that. Otherwise I was just screwed. Yeah. <laughs> no, I agree. And I felt like I said a minute ago, like, dude, I've never cried ever over 
politics. Like it takes a lot to make me cry. First of all, but yeah. second of all, I've never cried when any other president was in office over how they were handling something or treating a minority group or treating a group of people more than I've cried in the last four years, reading headlines. I would, I remember reading headlines and going, there's no way. You can do that. I know. You just can't say that. And then I'd click play and then go, Oh my God, he actually said, yeah. Oh my God, he actually said it. He <laughs> said it. it. <laughs> Holy shit. How can you do that? You know, mm-hmm. and that week when they were counting the votes, Oh my God, dude, like lost sleep felt so stressed about it. Um, I actually took out <laughs> not even joking. I got this. This is Pete Souza, the um, Obama photographer. It's a good coffee table. Oh, wow. It's so good. You should get it. It's lovely. Yeah. Um, I actually had this sitting next, like on <laughs> my bookcase. I had it more like this, like out. Wow. So that I could see it more frequently to just totally. be like, it's going to be okay. We'll it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this, you know, uh-huh. because I needed like someone presidential who like had their shit together, who could be, oh, like just nice and just human calm, and not like, yeah. I never knew how much I loved George Bush until this, that I was like, he was a great dude. <laughs> comparatively. <laughs> It's so interesting. Like it was, you know, I'm uh, I'm just about to finish Obama's memoir, and you know, oh, one the, of the first volume, yes, first volume. It's so good. It's so yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I yeah. love it. You know, and I've never again, like, you know, we're really on the same page here. But like, I've never been interested in, you know, it's always just been, in my opinion, a bunch of muppets and a bunch of robots doing what they need to do to run the country. I've never been interested. And then you get this person that comes along that says things like the China virus, and it's just like. Okay, like, yeah, okay, I understand, you know, that's where the genesis, the source of it was. But if you're trying to, look, my assumption is that the whole world should be aiming towards world peace, right? (laughs) That's not the idea. We're not trying to divide, you know, and I've tried so hard to to listen, um, you know, to, to different sides of people saying, finally, we have a president who is happy to say what they want. But Obama's memoir is a really great example of why presidents and politicians shouldn't say what they really think. There, there is a time and a place for authenticity, absolutely. There's also a time and a place for conformity because if you are trying to bring a social group together, being one of the social group means that you have to necessarily sacrifice some of your own individuality. And I think Obama's memoir, one of the parts he talks about um, – what Lincoln did to free the slaves and how he made sure that people on the sitting at the table, I can't remember what what the name of it is. He made sure he picked people that didn't agree with him so that he, he got the the greatest scope and the, the the best understanding from all sides. To me, that was a a really great moment in the book because like, that's what leadership is all about. It's a, it's about putting your ego aside, your, your individuality aside, because it's not, I am the leader. It's, okay, what are we all going to do together? And, um, you know, coming from the social media world of go your own way, do your own thing. You know, I think my ultimate spiritual teacher is Alan Watts, who's always try to find that border between yin and yang. There's too much yang, introduce a bit of yin in your life, you know, and there's this big push in social media now to, um, you know, do what makes you happy. Obviously I'm all for that. Um, You know, just go your own way. But the the true winners on social media are the ones that do it in a way that also benefits the group as well, you know? So, so many interesting things to take away from, uh, yeah, the last four years, as you say. Mm. And in his book, um, God, I loved reading that, by the way. I did it um, audio book and um, I literally felt, and we moved house a few months ago. And so I was pounding the audio books with packing and unpacking. And I literally felt like I was hanging out with Obama every night because I would like listen to it for like two or three hours because it's a 30 hour book. For those of you that don't know, it's a very, very long book. Most books are like six to eight hours and this one is 30. It's a beast. Um, but yeah, when I was listening to it, it was just like, oh, Barack, you know, it's like we're buds <laughs> hanging out every night. <laughs> so but it was so, you're right. It was so interesting hearing how many things were going on like behind the scenes 
globally over his presidency that we had no idea what was really going on behind the scenes and hearing how many times he would bring people together mm. to make decisions, bring people on, um, even on his cabinet who he didn't really agree with. Like he didn't always have everyone on who was just like rah, rah, whatever you say. Um, yeah, it was such an interesting, um, snapshot to look at that. And, um, I think you're right that part of what, um, was so, comforting about Obama was how unifying he was and bringing people together versus Trump is so divisive. And then if we go back to trauma, thinking about the brain, what yeah. creates safety? Someone who's unifying and promoting us all getting along. And what does not promote safety is someone who's trying to stir the pot and trying mm -hmm. to make fights happen that aren't even there. And, um, yeah, I think about that. I, I would love to fast forward the clock and to see what like my kids are going to be learning in like their history books one day about, you know, the last four years and what is actually written because, and, and also too, I'm curious to see what the trajectory is like the long-term mental health impacts of this, because mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. if I was feeling this way and I'm an American living overseas for my friends and family living there, like the stress and stuff that they've been under the last mm -hmm. four years has been, especially for people who are of a minority. Mm -hmm. um, oh my God, it's been so stressful. And mm -hmm. so like, um, I remember speaking to a friend of mine who's Mexican and, and he was saying, um, it's just so weird to have like the leader of the country that you live in you know that he doesn't like you just because of where you're from and having to explain that to my son that yeah the boss of america thinks that we're shit or what did he say like they're all criminals and rapists i think he said mm -hmm. um about mexican people and um him saying like how do i explain that to my son mm -hmm. you know he's 12 he saw it on the news um how do like i and i think about that being an american living in australia what if in Australia, it came out that everyone hates Americans and Americans are shit. And then I'm like, ah, oh, it's just, it's so, yeah, it's so, mm -hmm. so crazy. But I think um, it's good, the direction that we're heading. But I do think it's going to be interesting to see the trauma impact of the last four years. Because if we use the definition of um, any experience where you feel profoundly helpless or lose your ability to cope, dude, so many people the last four years have felt profoundly helpless massively helpless in their situation having him as the leader and stuff mm. i just think it's going to be very interesting to to see the trajectory and like what yeah i think it's going to be nuts to see what happens in this it it was uh yeah i mean hopefully we can put uh 2020 behind us that was uh it there was a, it was um there, there's like a documentary on it on on netflix um it's like a parrot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, the satire. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like the weirdest thing. It's like Samuel L. Jackson um, is like yeah. getting that. But the weirdest thing that I found about that was like that whole white tiger um, thing on Netflix, that that documentary about the people in America with the tigers. Like that was in 2020. That, that's yeah. like 20 years ago. I just totally. can't yeah, believe. Tiger King. Yeah. The Tiger yeah. King. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. I just yeah. can't believe how much shit went down last year, you know? I know, dude. And that was at the beginning when we all were like, this whole quarantine thing is kind of fun. We just yeah. get to binge watch Netflix. And it's like, no. Exactly. <laughs> nope. I know. I know. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Well, Heidi, we could um, we could talk for hours, as we always do, and I love it. Um, yes. But I'm aware of the time. Um, bringing it back to uh, your work and the courses and, and what you're doing, what's coming up for you now in the, in the next couple of months? Um, going, I'm looking forward to getting back into, um, schools and physically, hopefully getting to do some in-person, um, public speaking stuff. So anyone listening, if you have a school, uh, primary school or high school that I'm in Melbourne, but happy to travel, um, that has a primary school or a secondary school that is interested in mental health, learning about parenting, learning how to, um, help your kids manage anxiety or anger or how to traumatize them the least amount possible as a parent. Uh, I do presentations on that at schools and also webinars. So if you are further away, I can do webinars too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I do a lot of webinars and then the parenting program. So yeah, I have a parenting program where uh, it's all online and teach you kind of parent school, basically teach you mm -hmm. how to transform your parenting and like enjoy it. Cause I think that's a 
the thing I see a lot with parents is they hate it and they, their kids hate it. And so everyone's miserable. So yeah. trying to make it like a better experience. Um, and then also have a membership community where we do monthly trainings and monthly. So it's like, yeah, there's lots of different ways to have more of me in your life. If you want to <laughs> learn more stuff. Um, yeah. Totally. Guys, everyone should have more fighting. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, finally with, uh, with your own life, Heidi, um, yeah. what's something that like you're dancing with at the moment? Like a, it could be like a habit, um, a belief, an idea or a quote or something you're kind of playing around with that's interesting and engaging. Ooh, I'm rereading. So I'm a big fan of Pima Chodron. I don't know if you know any of her work. No. Um, she's a Buddhist nun. Hmm. And, um, one of those people that I reread and Eckhart, I reread a lot. I reread probably New Earth and Power of Now once a year at least, but um, I reread a lot of Pima stuff. And one of the things that I'm rereading now is about the concept of hope. Mm. And she is a big believer that we should have abandoned hope and to stop being hopeful as one of her kind of big tenets that she teaches on and, and writes a lot of books on. And so um when things fall apart is the book that I'm currently rereading again. And that really struck me yesterday. I was um, reading that and she was saying how um, hope can actually create so much suffering for mm. us because basically when you're hoping you are not um, accepting the present moment as it is. Mm. And that causes you more suffering. Whereas if you just soften into what is, this is what's happening. It might not be what I wanted or it might not be how I thought it was going to unfold, but this is what's happening. And when you can learn how to, um, I hate the word surrender because it irritates me. I like the word flexible instead. So when you can practice being flexible with what is rather than resisting it, because what you resist persists. And when we resist that, we create more suffering for ourselves. So this concept of hope is hope is dicey with trauma, right? Because when we're doing recovery stuff with trauma, we have to, or we've been taught, I think that we have to hold on to hope that it's going to get better and um, that hope shifts things and, and lifts things up. And she has a very different way of kind of flipping that conversation around with hope and looking at it differently, which is what would happen if I'm just flexible with what is, and this is what's happening and stop trying to change it and stop trying to, I'll be happy when I get there. I'll be happy when here and this whole, and that's what hope is, is saying, I'll be happy here. And she's like, well, what if we just said, I'm going to be flexible with what is and, and just sort of stay in the now. And so, yeah, that's what I'm kind of really getting a more fluid understanding of um, and trying to apply to my own life more would be that. That's so cool. Um, no, I love that. You know, the, the greatest thing that ever happened for me and my knee was, uh, you know, when I gave up, uh, wanting to be an AFL player and, you know, my knee doesn't swell up anymore now because I'm not, uh, attached to that idea. So that's, um, that, that really, um, it takes a personal tone. I really like that one. That's cool. And I agree with you as well. Surrender has got such like baggage to it, that word, or, or it was, it's like, makes you feel like you're giving up. But I think flexibility is more like, I'm not giving up. I'm just kind of like looking over there now, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And being curious. I think when you said a minute ago, or when you were saying about um, how do we, you know, minimize the trauma that impacts us or, you know, how do we, I can't remember what it was that you said, but something like that, like of how do we not be as damaged from things in time? And I think it's curiosity and awareness that you have to be, constantly curious about, Oh, that was a funny reaction I just had, or, Oh, that rubbed me the wrong way. Why? Um, Oh, well, that was an interesting thought I just had. And just sort of being really curious and observing stuff rather than running away with it or taking every thought as truth or um, yeah, I think it's just being curious and then awareness, right? Cause nothing can change. That's not yet been observed. You have to observe it first. So if I can observe and be aware of my feelings, my thoughts, other people, whatever, then I can shift and I can create more consciously mm -hmm. um, the life I want mm -hmm. and the life I've imagined rather than what I'm sitting in now that might suck or I might hate it or whatever. So yeah, I'm a big believer on awareness and curiosity. Yeah. That's brilliant. Heidi, thanks so much for, uh, for, for sure, chatting. Dude. It doesn't even feel like a podcast anymore. We just, it's just us hanging <laughs> out. So I think it was, uh, 
too too long since our last chat. So um, and again, yeah. it's my fucking podcast, so I can get whoever I want on the show. <laughs> yes, God damn it, yes, we'll do it again soon. We'll Absolutely. Again soon. Absolutely. Guys, thanks so much for listening and speak to you next week. Hey guys, if you enjoyed the content, uh, you are more than welcome to click the link in the description below. That will take you right to a free webinar where I will be taking you exactly through how to design a framework for your life and create that mission that will bring about a sense of intrinsic value to you. Go for it.